Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Lin Ma from ByteDance. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share some of our ongoing effort in building a serverless resilient graph analysis framework with a hierarchical persistent storage by leveraging the powerful capability of Ray. So typically, this is a uh, Ray use case as well uh, in the graph domain. So before uh, I'm going to elaborate how we use the Ray. I would like to first recap how the existing uh, uh, graph computing system looks like. So graphs um, are relational data structures that can define information collectively by using the um, uh, node and edge uh, structures in a nonlinear way. We can store a lot of information. Um, for example, nowadays a lot of uh, 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 real world applications. For example, the um, interest or the uh, behavior-based search or recommendations, uh, like uh, uh, your uh, Twitter accounts, social networks, your uh, Netflix uh, movie, movie stack, as well as the uh, biological networks, IoT devices networks, all these are real applications that can be represented by graphs. Um, so uh, this, we also have a, a wide adoption in our company as well. So we have a thousand of graph computing jobs every day. Uh, a whole bunch of algorithms. For example, we use the page rank to identify the top content creators in TikTok. And also, uh, we have a connected components to capture the cluster for bad accounts, bad behaviors. And also, um, like uh, between its centrality, we, we use it to extract uh, the features for downstream applications as well. And all these algorithms run on super large scale um, uh, graphs. Uh, say like a tens of a billions of nodes and a, a, a hundreds of a trillion of uh, edges. So super large, gigantic number of uh, nodes and, uh, and uh, uh, edges. Um, we started with Plato, so which is actually a uh, open sourced uh, prego like system. It's built by a vertex centric uh, 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 methodology. So what, the, uh, the, the, what is the vertex centric? So basically for every iteration, you update every vertex by fetching the in-neighbor data. And uh, this is, every iteration, there's a clear vertex-centric barrier. So which means this computation happens for every vertex. Before it's done, you cannot move on to the next iteration. So we can see it's clearly a BSP model using the MPI for data passing, right? So um, in our effort we, to meet the production requirements, we did a lot of you know, enhancement to that. This includes that we adapt more, implement all, more algorithms of graph on that. And also we extend the data ranges. Um, we fixed a bunch of bugs, especially the MPI related. So here's something that really had a, so um, when, the, when the graph becomes really large, the socket issue becomes available. And uh, the um, negative length issue becomes available. And also the um, MPI uh, randomly fail because of the, uh, the system-wise assertions. So this happens quite frequently, like a thousand times a day. So all this comes to our headache that uh, what's the problem of it, right? So firstly, it has a high cost because the plateau loads the entire graph into the uh, in-memory. So in order to host a really big graph in our real production case, we would have to large, a large number of nodes. Um, so which means uh, it's very nose consuming. And also uh, it suffers with high maintenance cost because uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's frequently failure with MPI and there's no checkpointing for that. So which means even you train, if, if you, even if you uh, do a computing job for 10 days and at, at the very last second, if it failed, you would have to restart from the very beginning. So that's very time consuming and resource consuming. And also, although it is vertex centric, but it is a mix of a pull and a push uh, lambda functions, which make the uh, program really um, not uh, friendly and uh, hard to program. So to deal with these three issues, um, what, what we are thinking about is that uh, um, maybe the hierarchical storage can help, right? If we leverage the NVMe and the SSD, uh, we can offload the uh, large amount of data off to the out of core memories. Uh, in this case, we can reduce the, uh, the, the computing uh, nodes uh, scale. For example, uh, normally when you use a thousand nodes, now pr probably you, you can just use uh, tens of that, right? Or even smaller number of that. And also the uh, fault tolerant part. Uh, we want to cover the fault tolerant part. We don't want any uh, recompute in an unnecessary way. 
and uh, we want to have the end-to-end -end failure recovery for the uh, super large uh, graph for the uh, graph computing job. And lately, um, we wanted this one to be uh, very friendly for, for uh, graph scientists to write their own algorithm, to implement their algorithms. So that's why we try to define uh, UDI, UDF with Python APIs, uh, since this uh, greatly simplifies the APIs. So here is uh, some of the motivation that we uh, uh, do this work. Um, um, so uh, based on the uh, analysis, we try to build our uh, internal uh, uh, bad gap solution, uh, which is uh, uh, the, uh, bad, uh, the, the, the ByteDance uh, graph and analytics platform. The gap is for the um, short acronym for graph and anal uh, analytics platform. Um, so how the system looks like? We can see from this figure, we have uh, uh, several um, uh, components in this uh, system uh, overview. So in the middle, there's uh, uh, workers. Uh, workers are the major components of this uh, system. Um, so the worker is the place where uh, we really implement the compute operators that implement the uh, different al uh, graph algorithms. Um, for example, graph mining uh, workers uh, logic and graph computing logic, they all implement in this part. And they communicate with each other through the MPIs. And be below the um, workers, there uh, persistent uh, uh, volume, persistent storage, uh, in which it is actually um, a, a hierarchical storage uh, of different layers. It could be DRAM, could be PMAM, could be SSD, or a combination of those. Um, so uh, the persistent volume actually uh, fetch the uh, partition, the graph data from remote file systems. In addition to that, during the computation, during the entire worker computation, the intermediate states will also be recorded, will be saved into the persistent volume. For example, the checkpoints, the messages. Um, and, and that's the uh, persistent volume part. And at the very top, the red part is the job server and the cloud scheduler, which is actually a, um, a service engine built on top of the Kubernetes to provide uh, uh, several important capabilities. The first, it provides a flexible uh, cluster resource management. So by using this, um, uh, the resource man management can be uh, purely transparent to the users. And also uh, automatic deployment capabilities. When user large uh, graph computing job, it's normally uh, uh, with a, a lot of uh, workers, right? So all this um, uh, handling work can be, uh, can be covered by this uh, service engine uh, to finish the auto automatic deployment. And also, um, we decouple the, uh, through this architecture, we decouple the compute and storage and provide the end-to-end -end, uh, fault tolerant. So we can see the workers are purely stateless. So the workers are uh, getting the data from uh, persistent volume. Uh, by this means, uh, whenever workers failed, we can have this engine automatically relarge the worker and uh, hooked with the correct uh, volume that stores previous states and uh, resume the work, resume the uh, graph computing job moving forward. And, uh, um, and the last is the uh, heterogeneous storage, uh, storage support by this engine, uh, which I already mentioned. So how do we implement this? We implement and deploy it on the cloud using the Kubernetes as well as Ray Elastic. Ray Elastic is uh, our newly built uh, in-house uh, a, a infrastructure uh, components, uh, which I will talk about that after, after uh, like two, two slides later. Um, so why we use Ray? Because we can easily um, have this distributed abstraction and a programming model to scale our workload from single node to any scale. Right? And also, it has a rich ecosystem for libraries that we can easily hook on and use out of the box. We even build our own uh, Ray platform within a company on top of the uh, Ray operator and auto scalers. If you can see from this figure, we, even, we also build our um, quota management, job management, um, dashboard, workspace, and so on and so forth, all the orchestrations. And we also provide services within a company based on this real platform. For example, auto ML service or inference services. Um, so how this uh, graph computing system looks like on the cloud. So basically uh, from this figure, uh, I wanna show that when a request comes, uh, the Kubernetes uh, controller will create a resource for this particular uh, cluster. So it's a job cluster, job-based cluster. Um, the, when a job is done, the cluster can be reclaimed. So 
it is the Kubernetes uh, controller to create the resources for this job. So in this job cluster, um, as, as uh, normal other uh, Ray cluster as well, there's a head, there's a bunch of workers. The head will keep the states of entire um, uh, working group. For example, individual uh, worker and its rank, and also the global, uh, the world size of all the ranks, as well as the relationship mapping between the workers with the uh, volume, with the persistent volume through the pod. And for the rest of the working uh, worker pod, so basically uh, we have a, a, in each of the pod we have an agent. The, the, the driver of this program will launch the agent to each of this pod. And in each of the pod, the agent will serve the role to launch the worker, launch the real uh, graph computing workers, and uh, uh, cover the full life cycle of the worker. Um, and uh, have the worker interactive with the PMAM, with their data stored in the, in the PMAM persistent storage. Um, so uh, why we have this layer of agent? So that comes with the, uh, our internal build uh, infrastructure, we call it Ray Elastic. So it's actually a agent or a Ray agent based fault tolerant control plan to cover the entire end-to-end uh, -end fault tolerant. So, um, Again, it's an agent-based control plan built on Ray for the uh, precise and stable rank management and the, um, and the fault tolerant. Uh, for example, I hear this example. Um, uh, for arbitrary worker pod, right, uh, we have an agent in it. For example, the agent is with a rank K. So the rank K agent will launch a worker and assign the rank to it as well. Um, and the, um, the worker of rank K will talk with the PMAM volume of rank K as well to retrieve exactly what is used to be, or what the, what's the previous states used to be. So we see in this um, complex interaction, the container may fail, and the agent may fail, and the worker itself may fail as well, right? So um, here, um, by using the array elastic, we can actually handle the failure from end-to-end -end perspective in different three layers, from container level, from agent level, from worker level. That's actually a synergy that MPI simply cannot fully cover. And uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the container level, uh, whenever the container fails, we use the Kube array to relarge the pod, to recreate the pod, right? And when the agent is failed, uh, the agent actually try to negotiate we call rendezvous, to negotiate and uh, um, assign and also match the ranks for workers and the persistent volumes. Um, and when it's fail, it easily can detect which rank is wrong and which of the new worker that I need to schedule to. Um, and the, the at the worker level, when the worker is failed, we don't want to start from scratch, right? So the worker has the checkpointing and the recovering capability at which um, you can start from where you were, right? Whether you got filled. So with all of this together, we can ensure the automatic recovery for any iteration of any worker uh, and uh, with any of the uh, arbitrary rank. Um, so that's actually an end-to-end -end perspective for the fault tolerance based on the real elastic. Um, so um, to be more detailed, um, we define this as a, as, a, uh, as a general SPMV control plan because it works for all the MPI-related, um, finer green controlled um, th this system. So we call it uh, uh, SPMD, it's a single program multiple data. So this can apply to this kind of system. Um, Ray Elastic as an infrastructure component can be easily adapted to this kind of computation uh, based on Ray. So in this figure, we show how it looks like in detail. So basically, a user have a driver program, and, and the driver will launch the elastic agent in each of the pod. So what does the elastic agent does? It actually rendezvous among all the agents, uh, negotiate, and provide a stable rank. Um, they, can, um, they can associate the rank of the worker with the persistent volume that hooked or marked with the uh, computation pod. Um, so the agent, another role is to uh, manage large and manage the entire work cycle, a life cycle of all the workers. It can be single, it can be multiple. And the worker can be even different languages. For example, in our case, uh, the graph computing worker is actually written in C++. So basically, the elastic, elastic agent is covering the C++ worker um, uh, from the process level. 
And a multi-elastic agent, we see another module called a rendezvous registry. So this is actually the real place where we keep the states. We keep the states of every agent, for example, the ranks of every worker, and the mapping with the worker with uh, the mapping of the worker with the uh, persistent volume through the pods. Um, so here is the um, like a, a little bit detail about uh, how the ray elastic uh, implement by the uh, by using ray. Um, we uh, have uh, some uh, experiments. Uh, again, so this is also an ongoing work. So it's not on a super large scale of data, but uh, uh, we do it in, a, in two data sets, a smaller one and a middle, middle scale. But still, we can uh, show some of the effectiveness. Uh, so basically, we uh, play this uh, ex experiment in a, a small cluster, which has the nine physical machines in a Kubri uh, cluster. We play with two, two data sets. Uh, two algorithms and also two trials. So um, Twitter data sets, we have 41 million nodes. Uh, for the UK Union data set, which is larger, uh, we have uh, uh, 133 million nodes. Uh, we have uh, 5.5 billion edges. So two algorithms we, we have uh, uh, played with in this uh, experiment is page rank and the uh, kinetic component. And uh, we do two sets of uh, experiments. The first is the PMAN plus the uh, DRM version. So we use the P, uh, we use the PMAM to store the graph, the checkpoints, the messages, all the intermediate intermediate states, and uh, for the DRAM only, we only use the DRAM to store the graph, to store uh, the, the the graph, the checkpoints, also messages. So um, first, I would like to show the um, the the the, uh, the PMAM offloading, right? So uh, we see two set of uh, uh, figures. On the left side, it's the um, uh, runtime. Uh, and the, on, on the right side is the total uh, DRAM memory footprint. So what do we do here? We, we um, scale the number of pods for the same problem, same graph. We scale the different number of pods. So um, let's first, uh, first focus on the, uh, the runtime. So we can see as we scale, the, uh, scale up the number of pods, actually we got some linear speed up at, um, of the uh, runtime. And also at the same time, when you compare the blue bar with the orange bar, so the orange bar is the DRAM only version, and the blue bar is the PMAM plus the DRAM version, we can see there are some of the degradation. The degradation from the data seems like 10% or 20% less than that, but it's almost comparable when you use the, uh, the, the PMAM. Because uh, PMAM, um, uh, it has a, um, because the, the, the read and write pattern is a hybrid. So we keep reading, keep writing in a kind of random way. So that's why using PRAM, we got a performance degradation. And a 10 to 20% is uh, purely acceptable and comparable. Um, on the right side figure, we can see it's a, the, the total uh, memory footprint, that in memory. And uh, Obviously, we can see using the, uh, the, the DRAM plus the PMAM, the blue bar uh, drops to like one third of the, ori of the orange bar, uh, which means um, the peak DRAM usage drops to uh, a great extent, uh, to one third. And this is also, both of this, uh, this uh, observation actually true for uh, both the small data set and the middle size uh, uh, data set, uh, the UK Union. So that's for the uh, DRAM offloading. Um, and another set of experiment uh, is interesting as well. So we try to show how we use this method to save the resource and also the uh, fault tolerant time. So um, we we, we uh, lower the number of uh, we will lower the number of machines and the memory consumption by using this approach. So from this figure, we can see um, use the PMAN plus DRAM version. Uh, we can uh, show the minimum number of pods that can hold the graph. Um, for the for the for the Twitter one, we can see we can drop the pod usage from three to one for holding the Twitter data, um, and uh, and finish the computing job. Uh, for the UK Union, we can actually can uh, reduce the total uh, pod usage from six to two, uh, so all drop to a, a one third. So this, from a different perspective, means that. Uh, um, given the uh, fixed uh, size of the computing resources, uh, given, the, uh, 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 given the fixed uh, number of pods, we can fit uh, bigger models actually um, uh, uh, for, for, for the problem size perspective. And another uh, interesting uh, experiment on observation is that we try to show uh, how much overhead 
we uh, run into when we uh, have a fault tolerant recover. So basically from the observation, when there's no failure, uh, we, we run the Twitter and uh, the uh, page rank on the eight pod uh, experimental settings. Uh, so when uh, there's no failure, uh, the computing job can finish in about 600 seconds. However, when we inject something to make it fail at some point and get it recovered, so the overall time, uh, including the, the recovery time, will, will be like six, uh, 660 uh, uh, seconds, which introduces about uh, uh, 70, 60 to 70 seconds, which is like a 10% overhead for recovering. So this is a, um, also accept, acceptable because if without such a recovery mechanism, you would have to rerun the whole thing. So you ha will have another five or 600 to start from scratch. So from this perspective, uh, we believe this is really helpful for computing uh, super large uh, co compute jobs. Um, yeah, so um, here's a um, summary of how the uh, how we um, uh, design and use the uh, bad gap. So basically, we aim to use this uh, bad gap to process really large real world applications uh, with a gigantic number of edges and nodes, uh, 100 trillion uh, level, um, at a cheaper cost resources. Uh, use as, as much, as little resource as possible while still get uh, no unnecessary uh, recomputes as possible. So the bad gap actually features uh, several uh, important uh, 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 features, which actually I put all this in the in the title. So the first is uh, um, uh, serverless. Uh, we make it flexible uh, in, in a cluster to make it really transparent uh, uh, to the to the users, and also it's resilient. It provides end-to-end -end, uh, fault tolerance, and uh, uh, by using this uh, framework, there's no need to rerun the entire job. Um, you just need to start from the latest checkpoints uh, for all the workers. Um, also, it hires the um, uh, hierarchical persistent storage. So we heavily leverage the out-of-core storage. And we are also in the effort to build this uh, hierarchical um, uh, storage more, uh, more automatically, more smartly. And uh, um, lately, and also I think this most important for the, uh, for the Ray Summit, which is uh, the use case uh, that we use the Ray Elastic plus the Kuber Ray to build a general purpose a fault tolerant control plan for SPMD programs. So this not only for graph, you can use it for big data, for, for AI uh, applications, as long as it's uh, satisfied the SMP uh, computing, computation, uh, computation patterns. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, for, for, for uh, our work that I wanna share here at this moment. Um, I would like to take uh, any questions if you have. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I was curious, given the background of using MPI for, for message packs, passaging, have you looked at using actors uh, in lieu of, of message passing, or, or maybe I may have missed that part. Uh, which one? Use what? Using Ray actors for the message pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different way, right? Using Ray actors is actually RPC tri transferring, right? But uh, um, I mean, for uh, normally for graph computing, the MPI also has a very wide adoption for uh, HPC jobs, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, so uh, are you planning to open source this or like make it available to the public? Which part? Well, actually, Ray Elastic uh, and also Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, is already open source. So we, we uh, start with Ray community to build a Kubernetes from uh, by dance effort as well. We have another talk, uh, I think it's 3.30, also this room, talking about the, the Kubernetes, uh, I think with uh, uh, IBM people together. Yeah. I was wondering more about the graph processing framework, because you're promising that you'll support 100 trillion nodes, so that's something like I would be. Well, that, yeah, that's. <laughs> 100 trillion edges, sorry. Yeah. We, we hope to, yeah, but that actually, um, we also have some uh, to be uh, things Want to you know have a complication between the you know open source and uh, also application to be so I think I'm not the right person to at this moment okay. <laughs> announce something like that but we would like to uh, but it needs some time okay. and this is still ongoing effort yeah okay yeah. and uh, have you compared this with uh, Spark and GraphX? 
uh, not yet. We mostly compare that with our uh, in-house existing solution, which is a plateau. Okay. So we didn't compare that with the Spark that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This you. will be very interesting to compare as well. Yeah. But I guess, again, this is an ongoing effort. I think it's subject to a lot of optimization as well. So after we apply a bunch of optimization, I think it would be great to compare with the um, Spark with other um, peer uh, frameworks. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Hi, um, two questions. So could you reiterate the importance of rank and also is Ray Elastic using some consensus algorithm to resolve the ranks across agents? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good question. So um, because the graph is super large, we need to partition that, right? So each worker is cover a individual subsection of the graph. When we load the data, a large amount of data into the persistent volume, you don't want to reload it again, right? So that's why the rank, there where the rank is important. When the worker um, match the rank, the worker will fetch the data directly to that rank and get the part of the, correct the part of the data from the persistent volume. When it's fail, I mean the query rate will large a worker, but the worker doesn't know where to find the correct the persistent volume. And then the agent will tell, agent through the random rule will say, that, okay, random K failed, I'm the new worker, I'm the random K. So I, when I schedule that, I schedule the pod to the place that are hooked with the, um, uh, mount with the persistent volume that is ranked K, such that you can get the correct data. Yeah, if you schedule to a different node, which means you have to fetch the entire partition data to that new node, which is unacceptable because loading the data, I didn't show the time for loading the graph. Actually, it's very large amount of time for loading. The 600 mil, uh, second is, is ex excluding the, the loading time for the graph. That, that, does that answer your question for the rank? E yeah, but there is like some master agent that keeps track of the state or is it like a lot? Yes, that's the rendezvous. The rendezvous actually in the, in the master, in the driver. Um, yeah, so the, all the agents talk with the driver. So they, they, they negotiate uh, which is missing, who is the next. Yeah, who I am, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the concerns with rank-based approaches um, is that the graph is dynamic, right? Uh, you might end up with hot nodes, you might end up with more nodes being added to a particular subgraph. And so the question of repartitioning comes up. And it seems in this particular setup that the cost of repartitioning is going to be very high. Um, how do you think about that, and how do you think about things like hot nodes and other issues that can occur when you make a fixed static distribution of subgraphs across the different nodes? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So in any cases, repartition will incur a lot of uh, 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 overhead. That's, that's for sure. So even in this case, in other cases as well. So we also thought about how to do the uh, resharding, to do the like uh, um, uh, scale agnostic um, uh, framework that uh, we can, um, you know, for example, nine partitions, we, we do it in a 10 partition, right? So we, we thought about that way, for example, by uh, leveraging the um, consistent hashing and in a prefetching way, things like that. Um, but uh, that's actually not uh, um, in this uh, roadmap at this moment. <laughs> yeah, we, we thought about that. I, I'm here with you. Um, that's a, a hard problem, though. Maybe again on the uh, partitioning, I mean, does your graph fall apart naturally into partitions or is there, let's say, this overlap problem? I mean, graph partitioning, of course, is an NP-hard problem. And do you think about strategies like uh, not doing a strict partitioning, but maybe keeping parts uh, across several partitions, yeah, so that you basically have a shadow of your partition on other nodes to avoid, let's say, uh, the, the problems of, of strict partitioning? And maybe another question with regards to that. Um, as we can see, the, the runtime behavior of the algorithms run on the graph. Um, let's say uh, optimizing the partitioning scheme to the application or to the algorithm applied, um, and uh, let's say when to do a repartitioning and let's say when to keep it. Uh, do you implement strategies like that, or maybe learn even what would be the, the optimal partition scheme for a graph of that size? Yeah, that's a um, 
hard question, actually. Um, again, uh, we want to do the scale, but the scale in graph can be a really hard problem because you need to resharding, shifting part of the data. There could be some smart way optimizer to you know, planning the shift, uh, you know, minimize the shifting of data as much as possible, right? So that's one of the direction. And uh, uh, the earlier question you mentioned is how to partition the data with some of the hot, hot nodes, right? We actually, that's a good question. Actually, um, we had some investigation by uh, graph partition algorithms. We use some of them. I think uh, um, uh, by, um, from, uh, by observing some of this uh, hot uh, part of the uh, subgraph or something, we can um, further uh, increase the efficiency, um, especially when we do the partitioning. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely a Right. Right, and also that's really helpful for uh, reducing the um, uh, message passing, because if we partition in a really um, efficient way, you can uh, greatly reduce the message passing between each of the nodes. Because by vertex centric, actually every node need to send a message, uh, actually fetch the message from all the neighbors that update every node. So a lot of message passing among the individual nodes. So a great uh, partition will reduce, reduce that as well, yeah. Sorry, we're just gonna take one more question. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, just a follow-up question to the uh, Spark uh, GraphX question. Is there a particular reason why you chose Ray versus testing uh, using GraphX uh, by default. I mean, that's like a very standard, uh, yeah, distributed computing way of doing it. And you talked about uh, uh, what's the largest graph that you have tried, and uh, have you seen with Ray the convergence time to be much smaller for some of these uh, uh, algos, the point point convergence algos that you talked about? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So. The, the data size that we play with uh, showing here is uh, in a small middle size, but in the real production, we have a super large scale data set. So that's the second question. So for the first question, why we use Ray? Because um, it's, um, uh, we have a, a first uh, in the cloud environment, we, we uh, adopt the Kubernetes, which can provide a service management of all, all the real workload, right? Another thing is that Ray has a very powerful um, uh, states and also the programming model such that we can play with it and uh, um, uh, compose any logic that we want. For example, the, lo the, the rank-based uh, logic is easy to, um, to represent using the Ray APIs, using the Ray uh, patterns actually to come up with this uh, rank-based uh, uh, Ray Elastic uh, components. That's only for fault tolerance aspect, right? Like if some of the workers or some nodes go down, let's assume for a second that you don't have that problem. Do you still see uh, uh, any advantage over uh, other distributed processing frameworks uh, with Ray? Uh, what's the question? Say again, please. No, no, I'm saying, so the, uh, the, the state and let's assume the fault tolerance aspect is taken care of for a second. Uh -huh. Do you see any other advantage compared to other distributed processing framework in terms of, really, for example, uh, the shared memory? I can access some uh, uh, a state of another node in a graph much more efficiently. Is that an advantage that you see? Oh, I see. In Ray versus uh, other things. Maybe that that might sp speed up some of the uh, algos that you're writing. Yeah, I think. Uh, um the adoption, um, why we adopt Ray, and I think one of the reasons, as I mentioned, uh, we use Kubernetes for the serverless. We have a Ray platform. Um, the workload can be easily um, migrated, adapted to, to this part as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> did, did I answer a question? We, we can talk about more about that later. 